started. It's my pleasure to introduce Jana. I'm sure most of you already know her. The Threatened Species Recovery Hub Science Communications Lead with 10 years of experience in science comms. So yeah, welcome Jana and looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Can I also caveat that statement by saying, um, um, that uh, before moving into comms and engagement roles, I worked for 10 years in waterway management. Um, my, undergrad my undergraduate and masters were not in communications, they were in environmental science, environmental management, um, but you pick up a lot over 10 years. So. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Yugara land and to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, firstly, why do media? Um, I think it's a really important way to raise the profile of your research, you, uh, a program. So from our point of view, from the hub, I do a lot of uh, media that promotes Threatened Species Recovery Hub projects and the program as a whole um, because it's value, valuable to be visible as a program, particularly a program that gets government funding because it's much easier to cut a program that's invisible. And you, um, or you might want to raise profile of an issue because you want the community to care about that issue. Unless the community cares about things in general, it's hard to get a government to start spending money on something not spend money on because no one will notice. So there's plenty of good reasons to get things out to the general public through the media. Uh, it, yeah, it works to educate the public. You can use it to generate community support for an issue. Uh, if you do it right, you can have happy partners and funders because you're giving them acknowledgement, um, you're giving them opportunity to be part of it. You can also create unhappy partners and funders if you go along, barrel along and do media without consulting them or acknowledging them for their roles. Uh, it can help you reach new audiences and potential new research adopters. Uh, if you were just wanting to get your research used by the most relevant groups out there, doing a general media release is not the most effective way to do it. If you can identify those groups, go straight to them, engage them directly. But having said that, on many of the releases we've put out, so thinking of Bronwyn Hurst here at the University of Melbourne, her Foxnet stuff, after she did a stack of radio interviews on that project, we actually got quite a lot of contacts from people in NRM groups um, saying, or a local um, council saying, that sounds really relevant, can I get, in? I heard that, I heard that. Um, can I get in touch with the research team who are doing that? So it can help you reach new potential adopters. It sort of depends on your project too. So for Rochelle Stephen um, doing the release we did recently about her possum monitoring app. You, know, you need people in the general public to use it. I think it's absolutely perfect for that sort of thing. Uh, it can definitely increase your outmetric scores. Some of the media releases we've done for TSR Hub projects have pushed particular papers to be the number one performing outmetric score for that, for that journal. So it, it does help in that. And I think that's something that in the research world we will be paying increasing attention to. Um, and I think it can help you get more funding, particularly when your project's nice and visible and the community, you know, the government feels like the community cares about it, you know, it's worth continuing funding for that area. Um, so this is a sort of a condensed thing of some factors for success. Uh, having, having teenage boys, I'm going to tell you this nice and short now and I'm going to tell you it again at the end so that if you don't remember anything else, you hopefully remember these key points. Um, factors for success. Start with something newsworthy to the public. Be realistic about it being newsworthy. We'll talk more about that. Uh, it's got to be in the first sentence or two. Make things easy for journalists. So in whatever you provide to them, whether it's the copy of the media release or it's dot points or just some talking points, it's text that they can easily understand. It's not too long and waffly, it's concise. It's quotes they can use. You know, it suits the style of their publication. 
location. Uh, you've supplied the photos. You interviewees, who are just going to be available for the interview, is really available and easy to access, and people respond promptly. Then call and email the target outlets that you think this is really relevant to, that you want coverage from. Make sure they know about it. Uh, and make sure your speakers are available for a couple of weeks. Because some things can keep trickling through for quite a while. But I'd say if you do those things really well, you've got good chances of success. So typical process, if you haven't uh, done any media before, I'd encourage you to contact your media person if you've got one. So at UQ, there's Dominic Jarvis for science. Um, I've got his details at the end. If you're not part of TSR Hub or some other program that gives you some support, like the uni has someone, contact them, give them four to six weeks notice if you can. Give them a draft, if it's, if it's I'm assuming say it's for a paper, give them a draft of your paper, give them some dot points on what the key messages are. Uh, that's important, particularly when you're giving something to a uni media team where often the people don't have a science background and if you just give them the paper, honestly, they don't really understand it. Or they don't really understand the point of it. They can pull out some interesting sounding quotes, but they don't really get it. So give them some dot points about the real key messages. Um, if you've got any potentially public friendly graphics, like a map, something like that, give them that. Um, not lots of, unless you've got one graph that really nails an issue and is really clear and simple to understand, generally graphs aren't that easy to use for the public. Um, if you've got some related good quality photos and video grabs, give them that as well because those sorts of things really increase your uptake for media. Once you've given everything to a media person, usually they'll do the first draft. Sometimes you can, but they'll have to do the first draft. When you get it back, review it, refine it with your core team, like your supervisors or your, your, the people who are working on the paper with you. Um, and then definitely think about um, collaborators. Who needs, do they need to get input? Should they have some quotes in it? I'll talk a little bit more about that in another slide. Uh, you distribute the release talk about that more, and you wait for the interviews, and I'll give some interview tips, and then you keep chasing and pursuing extra programs as needed. There are an, an alternate thing, so that's for a general release where you see that kind of printed statement. Um, sometimes you might give something to someone as an exclusive. Sometimes you still prepare a media release, sometimes you don't. <coughs> sometimes you could just take advantage of something you've got, like this this, um, this article that we produced for Science for Saving Species magazine, which was on uh, tracking cats uh, in a night parrot habitat. It was a really good story, and we wanted to get some media on this. And so before we published the story, I approached uh, an ABC journalist to say, we're going to have this coming out. It's a great story. We could hold the story if you'd like to cover it. And we literally just gave them that and some dot points and access to the speakers. We did draft whole media release, and then she used the material from this. And by sending her that, she could see, oh, we had really great photos, and we gave her all the photos. So with an exclusive, um, so you might still need to all that background, but then you don't do that general release, and you're giving it to straight to one journalist. Have a discussion with them about what programs they're going to produce for and when. Because sometimes they say, oh, yeah, I love it, I love it, and then it just, it just doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Bumping. Um, so try and get, and, and at some point you might go, all right, we're not waiting anymore, I'm going to give it to someone else. Um, and you can still, I quite often offer an exclusive to a journalist to break the story, because that ensures me one bit of higher profile coverage, and then once it's out, say out by ABC or whoever it is, then I might do a general release. So the next day I put out a media release that goes through something. First thing, so is it newsworthy? You really need to nail a thing, a hook, your pitch that's newsworthy. And it's going to be newsworthy not to your scientist friends and colleagues, but newsworthy to our journalists and the general public. For it to be something newsworthy, it's usually got to be short and easy to understand, not some really long, convoluted 
statement with lots of different numbers hanging off it. So something that the journalist can easily understand and the media can understand helps. Things that really hook for media newsworthiness are things that there's something that's surprising or controversial or it's really cute or it's really topical because that because black throat is through in the media all the time at the moment. Um, I find the ones that work well are the ones that people would have an opinion. Your neighbour who knows nothing about environmental science, oh, they would have an opinion on that. They're the kinds of things that journalists often think, oh, that's how, you know, yes. My listeners will be interested in this topic. Um, something quantified and definitive, I said. So it, it really helps if you can say something like, you know, new research I, has determined that one third of, I don't know, bilbies, Blah, 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 blah. Not just some, some sort of vague motherhood statement, which often the department, when we give them a media release draft, they often want to go, go, oh, they suggest edits which make things sort of vague and motherhoody. But that's not definitive, that's it stops it being newsworthy when it's like that. So try not to just go for those general statements. Um, things that are not newsworthy in themselves, but the people often ask me to do media releases on. Is a workshop. We're having a workshop, or a meeting, or we're having a, there's a forum, or we've got a model, or an index, or a framework. When you think about whether something's newsworthy or not, think to yourself: How often have I ever opened a news app or the paper, or listened to the radio and heard a statement about something like that? Do you ever read the ABC News app and see a thing that said? A workshop of cardiologists in Melbourne this week, you know, they are talking about, you know, new protocols for anaesthetic delivery. No, it doesn't, it doesn't have that. It's actually not newsworthy to the general public. But if you really, really want some coverage for something like that, you, if you can find something that's a finding from your framework or your index or something and use that as the hook, you potentially then get the chance to mention the thing. It's including with books. When we do media release on a book, it doesn't work to just say, oh, there was a new book published. But you can say, you know, um, cats are eating 25 million frogs a year, randomly pulling words out of thin air, um, blah, 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 according to a new book, like blah, 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 blah. There's got to be the thing, the fact, the finding that will be make people get interested rather than um, the book itself. Okay, so you need a pitch. Really, you, the pitch is something that you will verbally, you might verbally say to a journalist um, or emailing them. 50 words, kind of max. You need to be out, what is my story? What's the newsworthy bit of my story in 50 words? And if you're wanting to pitch anything to the convo, that's what will work for you too. So you've got to really think about, before before you start writing anything long, really the hard bit is coming up with something that's punchy, that's short. Um, it, your pitch has got to say, tell a journalist straight up what the topic's about and why that's important or newsworthy. Um, and then, yeah, you'll use it when emailing, calling. Um, it needs to be simple enough that they can understand it, remember it, and they can go and tell their editor because the journalist their first step is they need their editor to say, yes, you can work on that story. And so they've got to be able to go away and tell their editor, oh, yeah, so I've got an idea for a story about blah, 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 blah. And the editor's going to go, yeah, that sounds that sounds good work on that. So they want it short, and if it's too complicated, you don't want them to go, yeah, I had an idea for a story. This sent me, someone sent me something. It sounded kind of good, but it's kind of this. And it's like, if they can't nail what the concept is, they're going to re have a really hard time pitching it to their editor. Um, and journalists, think of them as smart people who have no background in your area. Um, and so don't expect them to have any of the kind of background knowledge about why anything's important. You've just developed, you know, revolutionary new fox baiting protocol. But unless you tell them briefly why, why foxes are such a big issue for Australia, they don't know that that's important, for example. Um, and usually when you send them an email, you send them a media release or anything, they're deciding within the first, they're, they're generally, most people are only going to read the first two sentences and they're deciding, because they'll see lots in a day and they're deciding whether or not they're going to cover the story in those 
first two sentences, which is why I can never leave with like, you know, collaboration between the University of Queensland and the University of Sydney and the Australian Wildlife Conservancy and blah, 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 at work happy because they, they've not, they've already stopped reading and now they haven't read the rest of it. Sterols are very busy. So, um, here's some example pictures. I forgot to put the timer on. Um, I, won't, I won't go through all of them, I've got a few, but I'd say, um, Bronwyn Horatsky, this was a bit of a challenging one because hers was Foxnet, an individual based model framework to support management of an invasive predator, the red fox, and it was about a simulation model, um, which most people in the general public, honestly, they wouldn't even know what a simulation model is, um, and they wouldn't see why they should care. Um, we titled it New Research a Game Changer for Fox Control, and in sometimes it takes more time, but you have to help the journalists understand why, why we care about the game-changing stuff for fox control. So red foxes are one of the greatest threats to Australia's native mammals, and pose a threat to livestock. Australia spends more than 16 billion a year on red fox control, mainly through poison baiting. But new research has found that when programs aren't strategic, the numbers can quickly recover. And because of that title, they already knew that we were giving them some new thing. Um, uh, Bronwyn got a surprising number of interviews on this, for this one. So with Havens, um, Sarah Lake et al's uh, stuff on Havens, that was the paper. Um, we went with the hook of, even though it, it's everything about this big strategic analysis of or sort of inventory of havens and where new havens from should go, we need to find one thing that's the one hook that everyone quickly understands and makes, you know, makes people pay attention, which was 13 mammal extinctions have been prevented by havens so far. Further in the release, we get to talk about all the other things. Um, so uh, Steve Kearney stuff on, it was threats to Australia's imperiled species and implications for a national conservation response. Um, we focused on the 10 worst invasive species. And just like with that. Uh, and Jeremy, um, the composite measure of habitat loss. Uh, we've gone with the native birds in southeastern Australia are worst affected by habitat <coughs> loss. Not habitat, um, and and then you know red uh, led with one sort of stat on that. Uh, I'm going to show you kind of a typical format for a media release, but firstly, like here's the start of something from the Sydney Morning Herald on a story they wrote on that Havens piece. You'll notice they're kind of like call it like sentence paragraphs. Most sentences would be under 30 words, many would be under 25. It really cuts it down into some short, simple sort of statements. Sometimes they write in their own little Android random bits, like for this they, they led with, everything else was basically ripped off our media release except cat owners are being urged to keep their pets inside with researchers finding 13 of Australia's mammals now only exist in conservation havens. Um, we can't account for that, they just do it. Uh, so media release typically will have that kind of, you know, key things in the start, this was the one for havens, but has that kind of really sh quite short sentences. It's easier for people to join if they want to get more convoluted. But if you give someone a quite complex sentence with quite a lot of nuance, chances are they're going to turn it into one of those really short sentences and they're going to misinterpret your research and when they edit it down, they might get it wrong and suddenly it means the opposite. Um, I've certainly seen university media teams do it quite often that we give them something and then they go, oh, we made some edits for me, we think it sounds punchier like this, we want to run with this version and you read it and you go, it literally means the opposite in every place that you just jiggered with it. So the <coughs> keeping it short and simple to start off with really helps. Um, I always really flag that there are photos and speaker details available, telling them, look, I'm making this so easy for you. If there's videos, I'll put video. But the date, sometimes there's an embargo date. Um, 
It's quite typical at the bottom then to say, you know, and it's been published in and include the journal and hyperlink it. Sometimes we put it a bit higher up. Uni media teams always put that at the end. Uh, I always put a little statement about what the hub is, which sometimes gets included. Just also, even if they don't use it, if the journalist reads that, they can sort of see that, you know, we're, we're they should pay attention to what we're saying about threatened species, because we're this collaboration of 10 universities, blah, blah, blah. Uh, make photos available in Dropbox. Um, everyone's details available to be contacted. Um, mention co-releases. So imagine you've got your release. There is a lot to be gained from offering one of your partners to include some quotes. If it's a stakeholder, key stakeholder, another organisation that you want to work with more closely on something, acknowledging them, getting them to be part of that, um, it means they potentially have more ownership of whatever it is too, because you know they were they're part of the media release, they've been announced about it. We quite often, as a threatened species recovery hub, we quite often invite the threatened species commissioner to provide quotes. She really likes it. It's good for their sort of media profile. So it's just kind of good um, yeah, extra brownie points for that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, consider the people, you don't have to, but consider if there are people that it's worth doing that, if there's a collaborator or commissioner or minister or, or there's an NGO, um, having that quote from someone can show buy-in of an important supporter for the project, which just even in terms of the story, like um, in Bronwyn Fresky's case, if you can say, you know, in part fit from replying the research said blah, 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 it even says to the journalist too, this research is a big deal, Parks Vic's already applying it, and Parks Vic like it because they're part of that project and they're getting acknowledged. Um, fine with every other or entity other than a university, this kind of thing is quite easy. Um, any government entity usually, they're quite often quite happy to give you a quote, but they find it really, really hard to get the media release out themselves because of all their internal approvals. So they like it when we give them some acknowledgement by giving them a quote. Um, when there are multiple universities, decide who is the lead uni because the thing that all of the universities want to do is they want to be at the top, they want to be named in the first sentence because everyone's thinking about promoting their own organisation, that's fine. But it means that say, if you've got something that's a UQ, UWA, CEU, joint piece of research and you decide you really want to give quote to each one of them, you might not say to each of those media teams, do you want to co-release it? Because if, they, if they're going to co-release it, they're going to completely rewrite it to whoever their speaker is, have their speaker first. And sometimes it's all right and sometimes that's a pain in the neck. So um, just decide first who's the lead and get it right at least there and let those other teams know. Because um, it can get you more distribution if that's happening, but it can also annoy if it turns out that, you know, this is a University of Sydney um, arid recovery collaboration and they're the key people you want there, but you also had a quote from, say, Martina UQ at the bottom. Well, that's fine if when they put that out, she stays at the bottom. But then if you, the UQ media team puts it out and puts Martina up first and then that happens to get picked up more, then you're potentially going to I'll say our recovery in the University of Sydney if, if it gets starts to be talked about in a different way in the media. Um, distribution, usually the comms person will do that for you. Uh, typically, I'll do an email out to a big mailing list I've got, which I've got segmented by sort of states and um, whether they're national or local media and I'll make some decisions. Sometimes I'll just send it to a particular state or sometimes I'll pick out certain ones. Um, I, depending on what it is, people will often pay more attention if they feel like it just came to them or it's a bit more targeted to them. So I'll often pick out my most highest profile media programs or journalists that I would like to attract and I will be cutting and pasting and sending them one that is just going to them. You know, hi Sarah, putting this on your radar, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the ones that are like, some things that I think, oh, I've, I think local papers might run that, but I'm not going to do 50 individualised ones, then I'll do a group, just a group email out to them. Always BCC, that sort of stuff. 
Um, there's a, program, a platform called Cymex, which is the Australian Science Media Centre, where media teams and people can up, who have a profile, it's not free, can upload the release, uh, and journalists will go and look, go there looking for stories on it any day. Eureka Alert is the same kind of thing, but it's for the US and international. Um, I also do quite a lot of cold calling, particularly for higher profile things. Uh, things will go on the Hub website, the Uni website, and through social media. And depending on how something is going, if it's... By the time you've put out the media release, you've usually invested quite a lot of effort, particularly when there might have been partners and the, the, minister, the department and things like that. And so then if it just doesn't get picked up, that's a, that's a real pain, but I don't kind of take that as the defeat. At that point, I'll often start calling journalists individually, saying, oh, we've just put this out. I think it'd be really great for your program if you, you know, do me to send it to you. And sometimes then people go, oh, yeah, I don't tell them, oh, we put this out three days ago, no one picked it up. Um, so, yeah, and, and doing some individual target emails. Occasionally, I might change the date of the top of the media release to make it look like it wasn't three days off. Um, I don't know. Uh, this is what Cymex looks like. It'll just have the release, uh, media contacts, photo. You can have photos and everything attached that people can download. It is very useful um, and it will potentially get a much broader range of journalists, ones that say aren't on my mailing list. Anyone can go there and quite often we get international coverage from, from there. Um, okay, so you've gotten to the point you put your media release out, um, it's been distributed, you're starting to get some phone calls. So. Before you get to the point where you're being called up, here's some interview tips I've got. Pre-prepare some short dot points on your key messages. Keep them where you can see them for phone interviews. Make them short. Keep them on your lap. You can mark them off, tick them off as you say them. Particularly if you're feeling nervous, you don't want that feeling of, oh God, I can't think straight and I can't remember what I've said and what I haven't said yet. Or, or getting off the phone call and going, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't mention blah. Um, so if you have them on your lap and you can even little make a little note beside them, you have more confidence about that sort of thing. Um, practice with your non-science friends. Make sure they think you're talking in plain sentences. Um, get them to ask you some questions or explain, just explain it to them. Uh, avoid all jargon. If you have to use a, a particular piece of jargon, you have to explain it explain it in a nice simple way. Keep, keep your statements in the interview succinct. Don't go off on tangents, waffle or use caveats. Like, we did this study in Brigalow, which actually was based on the southeast fire region tax of, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, don't, just, just try and give them quite straightforward statements. Remember, don't think of, it's not like a conference where everyone in the room is a scientist who's going to be critically thinking what you're saying. Um, most people are just going to sort of take it, accept what you're saying if you're telling them this. We found that there was a statistically significant um, effect from this. We found this was really important. They're just going to believe you. You don't have to like tell them what statistics you use or anything like that to prove it. Um, sometimes you get a dud question because as I said, they're usually smart people um, which will just ask what they think are reasonably straightforward intelligent questions but they don't really understand the topic so sometimes they ask irrelevant questions. Um, and sometimes you can flip them around. I've certainly heard Sarah Lake do this pretty effectively a few times. Politicians do it all the time, but they do it in a very annoying way. Um, so they might ask you something like that's completely really irrelevant, but you say, oh, actually, that wasn't a factor. But what we found was the most important factor was blah. And this is a chance to talk about what you think it should be. It might be one of those dot points on your piece of paper. Um, and when they're done, if they've missed something important, they would, or you just think, oh, I've got that thing, that's the, actually the most important thing to talk about in this issue, just say, oh, can I just, can I add a final point? Or, yeah, I think it's important. Um, and I have, I can honestly say that maybe with politicians it's different, but with the science community, I don't think a journalist has ever deliberately misrepresented a scientist. If you're being misrepresented, Honestly, they don't understand you. And they tried to paraphrase you and they didn't get it. Great. 
Um, yeah. Just get a oh, yeah. Okay. Do you have a journalist there? 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 Do you have a journalist Can I just add the best tip Martine gave me? Um, because I learned the hard way that when they call you up, if you're not live on radio or something, it's just a journalist there, they will quote you exactly word for word. And I've learned that the hard way going, oh, I really said that word. Like, you know, saying things like, you know, you know, in the middle of the sentence, it's not very helpful. So the first tip that Martin gave me was, when you answer the phone, just take your time. Don't waffle. Don't use filler words. Think about the next word that you, you know, like you can do that. And they're, they're quoting the words, not how long you're taking to do it. So yeah. that was the best tip ever, because then you actually really think about exactly what words you want to use. Particularly if they're using it for print. You might yeah, not want to do that with your radio. radio. <laughs> not, obviously not radio, but um, yeah, when it's print, yeah, they're definitely. quoting the word for word, so. Uh, and your stuff up, you say, oh, that's obviously off the record. Well, what's on the record is. <laughs>
these numbers count syndications. And so <coughs> ABC, one ABC online story will only ever be one ABC online story. One ABC radio interview, say with ABC Brisbane, might be one. Or they might go, oh, that was actually really good content and it's nationally relevant, and so they'll syndicate it. They might run it on ABC Sydney and ABC Darwin. And you can sometimes get 50 extra channels on ABC, say, running it. Um, same thing with TV. Sometimes one ABC news story on TV might be one, or sometimes if they decide to run it nationally in all the news bulletins, and it's, I think it works out to be about 12 different ABC channels they might run it on. So, but I'd say typically, in terms of content they need to fill across the country, most there's more radio, you know, because there's so many local radio stations. Um, and they create a lot of their own content. So you probably, mm, I don't know, who's done, uh, Martin, would you, what would you say? Do you reckon more of your interviews have been for radio than anything else? Yep, definitely. Yeah. It seems low though. It seems really low for a newspaper. Oh, yeah, oh. compared to TV, like TV is like four times so. Oh, newspaper, newspapers, that's print newspapers. So that's like literally printed it in the career mail. So a lot of, yeah. I guess I just would assume that would have been and easier to get than telly, but it's the other way around. No, and especially because the TV has more, generally has more syndication. And those newspapers, I remember from it, that was like about <coughs> two or three in the Sydney Morning Herald, two in the Courier Mail. Um, oh, these, these, sorry, it was, there was a lot more in newspapers, but in these statistics, I completely pulled out any that had anything to do with Adani <laughs> or David Lindenmeyer or Deanne Sienovich. Because <laughs> Deanne and David are like small islands that generate their own weather patterns. <laughs> they just kind of, media happens around them. But I pulled out everything that had to do with Adani. So they were, it basically pulled out all of the... Um, yeah, also there's only two decent print newspapers in the country. So when you think about that, yeah, fair enough. Um, and the TV gets bumped up by some syndications of, of things. Uh, in a radio, usually your radio in interview will be over the phone, but sometimes they are face to face, like this case. It was an interview I organised for some wonderful Gumbra rangers. Um, so sometimes they're face to face or sometimes they're in a studio. Ask them how long an interview they're wanting to do, because that will really influence how much detail you start giving them. Um, and, and you can say, do you, do you want some sound bite? Or you can say, do you want some sort of short sound, snappy sound bites or snappy statements and then some longer discussion? Because they might be filing for more than one program, quite often they do. Um, ask them, definitely ask them, is this, will this be pre-recorded or will it be live? If it's live, you're gonna have to nail it. Um, you shouldn't think about each word. <laughs> but if it is pre-recorded, I wouldn't encourage you to do this endlessly because if you do it too much, you'll just tie yourself in knots and you will annoy the journalist. But if you start saying something and you realise you really messed that up, literally stop mid-sentence, go, oh, sorry, messed that one up. Um, make sure when you stuff it up, you stuff it up really well <laughs> so they really can't use the statement. Um, and then they say, <laughs> it's like, fuck. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, we found, we found that there were 12 species that had been said, oh, sorry, 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 have to start that one again. Can I take that one from the top? Uh, we found that there were 13 species. Um, so I have those, definitely, because most of the time it's, on the, it's over the phone, you can have those dot points in front of you. Uh, and you'll find that you just keep spitting out the same thing in all your different interviews. That's good, that's fine. You nail your, your content. That's, that's one of the reasons why people like Martine and John and Hugh sound so smooth on radio is because so many of the things they've said, they've said it before and they've really refined that message. You know, they've, um, they've got, they've worked, you, would, you'd have lots of things that you've answered similarly many times. Yes, same things. Yeah. Many um, metaphors are good. Yep. As well, analogies and, and putting things in context. Right? Oh yeah, but work them out beforehand. Don't try them on the spot because no, then you discover by the end, oh shit, this is, doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I always think it's uh, somebody's got to be 
he says we're planting 10 million trees. It's worth them translating that into how many hectares will be vegetated. Yeah. Or how many football fields, or how that compares with another country. Like if you clean this many hectares of habitat, which is roughly the same as Brazil, or turn any area, we created a marine protected area system for Australia, which is the size of France, Germany, and Italy, all yeah. stuck together. Because if you say 2.3 million square kilometres, I can guarantee you, what is 2.3 million square kilometres? Yeah. How big is Australia? No. So I've memorised the whole, so Australia is 7 million square kilometres, so I've memorised the whole heap of the size of the country. So you say, what, 1 million square kilometres? Kenya, Tanzania. Yeah. So you need, it's, it's quite handy to memorise the size of various countries so you can throw those numbers in. And also it's handy to memorise the, the, the diversity of certain organisms groups in certain countries. Yeah. Colombia, 2000. All those things help. Uh, but yes, don't try and do multiplication or division. Yeah. Or division. Yeah, that, that, that always fails. That is an excellent point about amounts and numbers and volumes. So with something recently wrote for David Lindemeyer and it had to do with lost water yield from the Victorian Central Island. So you know, and this is equivalent to um, the entire water use of Geelong. And within 15 years, it will be equivalent to the entire water use of Tasmania. Because you just say a megalitre, nobody knows. Nobody knows. I thought units of measurement were required to be in Sydney harbours or Olympic swimming pools. <laughs> yeah, usually for <laughs> volumes of water, but that was that was. Right. And never remember why. Somebody once told me there's only three Olympic swimming pools worth of gold in the entire planet. Hmm. Only three Olympic swimming pools, and that's all the gold in the world. Oh, that's amazing. I know, it's distressing, but, but once you hear it, then you can okay just ring on my finger. It's quite valuable. It's a little bit Why is gold so valuable? Because there isn't, there's bugger all in, in the US crust. But anyway, never, once people say those things, they're quite shocked. And volumes are even worse than distances. Can I say um, something practical about this? Uh, yep. If, if, you are, if you're going to do a studio interview, then you might need to be in the studio within really a short amount of time. So if you are putting out a media release, like have your phone on that night, let it ring at 5am, answer, you prepare to drive into the city immediately. So yeah. Be ready. I Don't wait till 9 o'clock to switch your, time, your phone on because oh yeah, all opportunities are gone. If you have a media release out, you are committing <coughs> to have your phone on almost 24 hours a day. You're allowed to turn it off between midnight and... 4.30am. <laughs> they do read a lot of 5am. Yeah, if, they yeah. These journalists are... So they want something, journalists. the breakfast show or something, yeah. and then if they want you in, in, that's fine if it's a phone thing, but if you've got to also get into the city, it's a hassle. And if you do drive time, that is the peak slow. If you mm. can get 7.30 to 8.30, or 4.30 to 5.30, that multiplies your listeners tenfold, because yeah. almost now nobody listens to the radio unless they're in the city. In the car. Mm. Yeah, drive is good. And drive I do... I do, I have many times gotten phone calls from journalists at 5.30, quarter to 6, wanting someone, and people have got turned their phones off and they're not picking up, and I can't get through to them until 9 and kind of missed it. Um, can you offer any sound effects? Like, if you were Danny's stuff, and she's got, you know, recordings of cockatoos, you know, they would love that. And you potentially might. If you offer that right up first when they first talk to you, then you might end up getting a longer piece. Um, online. So be prepared. They may well produce the story without even talking to you. They're just going to take the media release. They're just going to stick it straight in. Um, sometimes, depending on what their format is, some people have slightly shorter, um, like Australia, Australia, uh, Australian Geographic have quite short articles. They usually take the media release and cut 40% of the words and they run it, I guarantee it's about 40%. Um, they could talk to you. Um, they might email you or phone you. In, in, even if they phone you, if you're feeling really nervous about the whole live interview thing, if, if you say, what, what's this going to be for? And they go, oh, it's for an online story for blah. You can say, oh, would you, would you be happy to get state, written statements? If you want, you can email me your questions. And I'll be happy to send you back some quotes. Um, quite often they are quite happy with that. It kind of makes their life easier. They don't have to sit there and type it out. Um, and you might give you a bit more chance to think about them. Um, 
if it's over the phone, have those sort of notes ready. Uh, sometimes if it's a much more longer, a longer piece and it's more technical, um, you can offer, say, look, oh, you know, there was, we come quite a lot of technical material in that. Um, I'd be happy to have a quick look over just for the technical points if you want. Um, I know the style's your own. Uh, quite often they will say, yeah, and give you a chance. And then if you see something, I actually, actually completely flipped on it, said that's wrong, you can, you can flag that. You, you can't go so far as to start going, I, you know, rewriting and editing everything because you think it'll sound better. You've kind of got to respect some of that. Um, and, on, and you've got to get back to them immediately. Yeah, with everything. If they give you that opportunity, like, be on your emails and ready to turn it around and then they'll be fine with it. But otherwise, it just annoys them. That's right. You Everything's got to be again. really quick. Um, they will need a photo or two. It's very rare for them to run a story without photos. So make sure you offer photos if you've got them. Um, and do you have any related video to offer? If not necessarily a whole de designed up one, but if you were doing <coughs> walls in the Pilbara and you've got a little slow-mo clip or a GoPro clip where you've just released the wall from a trap and you see it bounce out of the trap and run off and it's literally five or ten seconds, even that, they will often love that and they'll embed it in it and you'll get, you'll get better uptake and they'll probably do better with the story. Um, with TV, if it's live you have to nail it. Um, if it's a pre-recorded if it's pre-recorded and it's in the studio but it's on a panel, so I'm going out of all of that, you pretty much have to nail it because they're not going to stop in the middle of kind of, you know, the pre-recording some panel discussion in case you stuff up. But in the case of the one where April was sitting in the room there and had a camera crew just doing something with her, if she felt like she really stuffed up in the middle of something, she, you know, you could say, oh, I want to do that again. But I really say, but definitely make sure you stuff up that first one so much that they can't use it. Go, oh, hang on a minute. Come on. I just have to think. And then do it, because otherwise they might grab that first one. If you just kind of say it and then go, oh, that wasn't very good, can I do it again? Then they might still use the first one, because they might not even listen all the way through. Just think of them as all doing everything is so rushed, they're not necessarily always paying complete detail of attention to all those details, like the fact that you said you wanted them to use the second statement, not the first one. Um, TV, it's much harder to get TV coverage without B-roll. So B-roll is any kind of that background footage, footage of your site, footage of you doing some of your field work. Um, if you've got some, if you've got a minute worth of grabs of things like that, it greatly increases the chance you're going to get TV coverage. As long as it's got to be high, high resolution. Not ridiculous, the highest quality you can get off the phone is usually enough, um, particularly depending on what the topic is. Um, the exception is when they, what you want for a panel discussion or <laughs> if it's a really hot topic like um, black throated finch. They'll often have, uh, you know, that was for TV, uh, but they didn't say, April, we're only interviewing you if you give us some footage of black throated finch, because they would have probably had some on file already that they keep reusing. So they all wanted, they, yeah. they still ask for it? Yeah. And a bunch of um, journalists called me to say we're going to get out our own. Where, where can we go to find a black girl to get our own footage? So yeah, they do best on it. Yeah, they really. It's you really can't produce TV with just talking heads. And so, whether or not they cover this story or that story in a day, regardless of how good the story is, will off, might often be very strongly influenced by how good, how much footage could they offer with it, and how good was the quality of it. Doing all right. Um, this is, it might feel like this. Megan Barnes being interviewed on some offset stuff. You know, you might have bright lights and all. But look, she's got a piece of paper with a key message at her feet in case she has to look down and reassure herself. Um, uh, to produce something that looks like this, Brandon was sitting in a little tiny black booth the size of a toilet cubicle, uh, staring into a camera with no one in there with him because he was across from Melbourne to where they, the rest of them were on a panel. People feel like it feels pretty disconcerting. I, I get that, but just be warned. Sometimes if they want you in a studio, and particularly if it's for ABC News 24, and they say we're gonna do a live cross, you'll be in a little black booth. Hayley Gale at CBU, they got her to come in early. She was sitting in the box for like 15 minutes, I think, before they crossed. By that stage, she kind of worked up into a bit of a panic, but. So it's also, you're looking at a red light. Oh, on the camera. 
Yeah, yeah when it's dropped in. Because you're looking at red light <coughs> in a dark room. It's quite... And in Sydney, yeah. if you go in and actually sit next to you know, there's a round table with a little view teller, all the tourists are wandering behind around. Like, yeah, it's a see-through. It's like a, you know, it's a goldfish bowl. So you're sitting there looking at you know, the journalists and there's people waving at you and like, oh, see, I'm telling you, you're, you're on television. Like, it's really like... <laughs> Do you have a tip coping with the black box with the red light? No, I shut myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm kind of committed to this really. I'm right at the end, which is good because I, I would like more comments from the crowd because there's a wealth of knowledge here. Um, just saying, in terms of the photos and video that you provide, show action, show things close up, decent lighting, um, you know, what was going on, it really gives a sense. Of it, it's a good way to also include your partners. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, just things like the, your target species, your threats. Try and have a range of sort of close-ups, some mid, some wide view, and a few lands. Well, for other comms, it's good to have some portrait as well. But usually for media, they just use landscape. Um, for video too, if you grab, grab it, getting a few snippets, make sure you, while you've got interesting field work happening or you're out in the middle of your study site, it might be miles from any um, ABC studio. They're not going to send a camera crew out to get you know, a one minute grab of you doing field work. You've got to collect that and give it to them. Get a few bits that are wide, courtesy of Nico, these, these bits, um, wide, go in a bit closer, get them closer. Always do it in landscape and always hold it nice and still. And GoPros actually produce pretty good footage and particularly if you're working with um, GoPro or your camera right up to the track through the wire. Um, Just on that, sorry, sorry, Anna. I was called by National Geographic. For Instagram, you have to do it the other way. Oh, for Instagram, yeah, yeah. for social media. I think it's good to get, oh, for, for video. For video has okay. to be that way these days, yeah. yeah. For all other video editing, they usually want it. So get both, but for other video editing, you won't want to escape. Um, this is an example. Uh, I would say, I've, People often give me photos like this, I'm just pointing out to you so you got it in your mind. Photos of the backs of people and with the animal really small don't work as well. If you're taking the photo, I know everyone's just focused on getting the field work done and you know don't want to be in the way and be intrusive, but get around there and just, just, just be annoying for five minutes and say, look, I'm going to get some really good photos and then we'll move on. So go around from the front, don't get the backs of people. Um, so I took those two of Brett and he was doing this but I said Brett just look up a minute and if for for you know for a news story or something that would be a lot better than just the top of his head um, and I put the, that was literally just my iPhone stuck up to the bars and I could also take a bit of footage like that um, that's a really engaging photo for for, for media um, Philly with a qual that's good if you want something of Philly but if you're doing a story on quals so much better to also give them one photo, which is a nice close-up of the coral. It's surprising how often I get photos of a of the study species given to me, but you can barely see what it is. Um, hardly work out whether it's a mammal or a reptile that's so far away. Um, so this was an example of just some video clips, but um, it, uh, it I didn't transfer the video file. And we're out of time. Um, so. I'm going to just remind those factors for success. Make sure you're starting with something that's newsworthy to the public. Develop a little pitch. Make it easy for the journalists to cover your story by giving them text they can understand, quotes they can use. You've given them photos, video. All the interviewees are available and respond really promptly. Um, you keep people, you've picked a time when everyone's available for a couple of weeks. And if you're being misrepresented, it's because were misunderstood. If you're not part of the TSR hub, there is communication support at the university. Dominic Jarvis, your main person, is his detail. He's a good guy. I think he is not the person who voted to Cybex today and dropped off the word habitat. That was someone else in LNC. Um, if you're working with the university media team, do keep in mind they generally have no subject knowledge in what your area is, so you're going to have to pay careful attention to the detail and make sure it's coming out accurately and be prepared to push back and check what has gone up and chase them if they've accidentally dropped a really critical word.
from me. But <laughs> but I think uh, we should, if we can, take a couple more minutes for any extra tips from the room for media, things I didn't cover.